Without skeletal muscle, we simply just will not move. Muscles are connected to bones by tendons, and upon contraction will cause joint movement, or basically just movement of our skeleton. So you'll notice from time to time there will be a random dude getting his pump on in the background. So the true method behind this is, uh, is so that you can continually see various resistance training exercises which will thus promote muscle growth and strength and with each movement different muscles are contracting either concentrically or eccentrically but more on that at a different time. So let's talk about the anatomy of skeletal muscle. We have this entire muscle belly which is surrounded by epimysium which is a big fancy word for connective tissue that surrounds the entire muscle. The muscle is then broken down into layers, and what makes up the muscle belly are fasciculi. Fasciculi are surrounded by paramecium, again, big fancy word for connective tissue. And the fasciculi then consist of muscle fibers or muscle cells. The muscle cell now, guess what it's surrounded by? Ah, more connective tissue called endomysium and consists of myofibrils, which are then divided into sarcomeres. And sarcomeres, the definition of that is the basic contractile unit of skeletal muscle. Now, you're an expert on muscle anatomy. So now we will focus on the anatomy of the muscle cell and how contraction actually occurs. So as we talk about how skeletal muscle contracts, we will also be covering the structures associated within the muscle cell. You'll also notice muscle cell, muscle fiber will be used interchangeably. So, we have this thing called an alpha motor neuron, which innervates muscle fibers, because we need an electrical signal from the brain or spinal cord to elicit our contraction. This may be voluntary, we want it to happen, or involuntary, no means no, I didn't want it to happen. So, the alpha motor neuron sends a signal, or action potential, okay, down the axon. On the axon are Schwann cells, which create a myelin sheath, or a fatty substance that insulates the cell membrane, fat insulating, kind of works. This sheath leaves gaps, though, called the nodes of Ranvier, and it appears that the action potential travels via salutatory conduction. This is a giant word, meaning the action potential jumps from node to node for faster conduction. So, now that we're at the end of the axon, we reach the site of communication between the motor neuron and the muscle fiber. At the end of the axon is the presynaptic neuron, which houses synaptic, synaptic vesicles containing the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, not acetyl-CoA. That's an enzyme. So, now as the action potential has reached the neuromuscular junction, the site of communication between the alpha motor neuron and the muscle cell, calcium enters the presynaptic neuron, and acetylcholine is released across the synaptic cleft and binds to receptors on the plasma lemma. The plasma lemma is a membrane that surrounds, in this case, the muscle cell. So now this triggers an influx of sodium into the muscle cell. So sodium enters the muscle cell. As sodium enters the cell, this continues the action potential that now travels down the T-tubules deep into the muscle cell, which triggers the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Whew, who knew there was this many steps that elicited skeletal muscle attraction? Holy Toledo, Batman! Okay, so without this calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, we will not have a muscle contraction. It just simply won't happen. Why, you ask? Okay, I'll tell you. Well, we know that the sarcomere is what causes contraction because it consists of the myofilaments actin and myosin. Myosin, the thick filament, pulls actin towards the center of the sarcomere. But there is an issue. Buddy proteins, troponin and tropomyosin, block the binding site between actin and myosin, which is known as the steric blocking hypothesis. So why we need this calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum is because that calcium will bind to troponin, which will then communicate to tropomyosin to get out of the way, and now, actin and myosin can now hold hands and bind together in unity. Ah, uh, But we're still not done yet. For myosin to pull on actin, which is called the power stroke, we need ATP. Duh, it's energy. Of course we need ATP. So, as actin and myosin are now holding hands, the myosin is in a 90 degree angle and cocked back like a pitcher ready to throw. But we must break down the ATP to elicit movement. So, 
ATPase, ends in ACE, it's an enzyme, breaks down ATP into ADP and PI. The PI is then released, which causes the power stroke. After the power stroke, the ADP leaves and another ATP will come, come back, and the myosin will attach to another actin and another power stroke will occur. And that is all that you, that is everything that you need to know in regards to a skeletal muscle contraction.